and it is about the good finance that we have to, to provoke and construct um, in order to include all the people who are at the moment excluded from our social and economic fabric. We talk about three billion people. How big is the world population today? Anybody? Seven million, six billion. You see, we talk about billions, but they are growing and they're probably going to double in the next 50 years. That is the prediction. And it is so brutally um, enormous. That we talk about numbers, billions today, some not even big anymore, but this is half of the global population has no or little access to finance. What does that mean? The biggest job generators in the world are the small and mid-sized corporations. And these little companies, they need working capital. The little butcher needs capital to buy the cow in order to, but to, to, to sell the meat in the next day. He needs to have working capital from the blenders. They have the cash cycles which can take up to a year. If we do not have an economic fabric that provides capital to all these enterprises, there will be no jobs. That's why finance is absolutely essential and the good finance is essential in order to create the jobs and to have a prosperous societies across the world. Today we talk about financial inclusion and how new technologies can help to financially include the non-banked. In OECD countries which we belong to, about 98% have a bank account. With a bank account you have an identity and with such you can do a lot of things. You're connected to economic fabric. Of the non-OECD, 50%, half have uh, no bank account, they cannot get capital and they cannot get loans, they cannot uh, do any commercial transactions whatsoever and the cost of transactions is extremely high and they have to borrow from friends and families which then leads to a, a limit of what they can do. So I would like to welcome all the panelists that we have today and I'm really, really thankful that you are here because we look at different aspects there are a lot of talks here in Davos about the new technology as such, but technology as such doesn't solve the problem. It needs a collaboration between all stakeholders. The stakeholders from the technology side and industry side, the stakeholders from the finance and markets which provide the liquidity in order to have new technology enabled into the industry, industrial fabric. And we need the correct policies which enable or to, of all these actors to and a collaborative effort to make transactions possible and safe across different jurisdictions. I would like to welcome Alexander from Geneva. Alexander is, yes, yes, please. <laughs> please welcome Alexander. Alexander from Geneva is a, besides being one of my dear mentors in order to try to understand the global economy and the global capital markets, has been a very strong influence in educating and forming the very policy makers that today guide the world and try to structure the capital flows and make them safe across the world. These include students which today had some of the largest treasuries. They are on the... They're presiding over some of the largest banks. They are leaders in international organizations like Bank of International Settlement, which is like the bank which regulates the financial flows of all central banks. Uh, they're leader in financial stability board. They're at the IMF, at the World Bank and so on. Alexander has been twice the president of the Graduate Institute. I come briefly, I touched this Graduate Institute. You will hear again and again because it is one of the hearts of forming leaders for our global institutions in order to make this world safer and more collaborative at the, uh, across different segments, not just finance, obviously in healthcare, WHO, we have about standard settings and so on. Second, we have the representatives of a big bank, the big banks which are portrayed bad, <laughs> sometimes, bank they can go down, they can go back up again. Veronica, please, please join Veronica from UBS, she's the head of innovation and she's right next to the chief technology officer, uh, which until last year was Stefan Moore, he's a friend of Stefan Moore who was here on our panel last year, who structured UBS and UBS is one of the leaders in trying to incorporate new technologies, financial technologies across the entire value chain of banking and in collaboration with other leading banks 
around the world. They're very engaged also with the ETH you can see in Zurich, with MIT in the United States, and other leading um, uh, institutions. Then we have from the consumer side, at the end we are all consumers of finance. It's just, it's like a product and a service. And as such, we have to serve the consumer better in order to provide credit and financial services. Today, this is a huge problem. I give you an example. You think this is a problem in emerging markets. Well, it is also a problem in developed markets. I am from Switzerland, and Switzerland perceived as be the capital of finance. Guess what? How long it took me to open up an escrow account. An escrow account is an account you put in money. You cannot take it out until something else happens. The escrow account is necessary to put in 100,000 to open up um, a, a company in Switzerland, a legal jurisdiction. It took me, guess how long it took me just to get an escrow account to form a normal legal entity in Switzerland. Anybody's guess? It's Switzerland. Three months. Three months. Nuria, next one. Six months, other. We're still waiting. <laughs> you must be from India, right? You go through the government. <laughs> but you're probably faster than we are. You were right. It took me exactly six months in Switzerland as a Swiss citizen with all whatever you want to open up an escrow, to open up a company. Who can wait six months to open up a legal entity? Investors walk away, partners walk away, and they think you're an idiot. You're a Swiss, you cannot even open up a bank account. Okay, perfect. So, well, UBS wouldn't even consider. By the way, I went all the way to the boards of UBS, the boards of Credit Suisse, their friends, the head of, uh, of legal affairs and so on. Well, compliance, compliance blocks everybody. I think we are more marginalized in developed countries than in developing countries today. It's really absurd. Anyway, so this is a thing the customer is not being served properly. Nuria, please welcome Nuria. She is one of the proponents of making the interface between the customer and the services uh, uh, much, much more efficient. Thank you for being here. <laughs> now we have Yorki from Microsoft. Now you talk a lot about Bitcoin, we talk a lot about uh, blockchain and cyber currency is all the buzz today. I don't know what the price of Bitcoin is today. Anybody knows? 13, 11? 10,000 goes up and down by 10,000 a day. I mean, it's amazing stable currency. It's fantastic for doing commercial transactions. <laughs> I think the Venezuela is more stable in the inflation rates than the Bitcoin. But everybody loves it and it seems to be the future. Fine. Now, all that is based on blockchain. And a lot more is being based on blockchain, as we learned. And Yorki, please welcome Yorki, the founder of the blockchain segment within Microsoft. 70% of the world's leading corporations, <laughs> sorry, 70% of the uh, uh, revenue strongest corporations in the US have the cloud with Microsoft. Now, Yorki works very strongly with the cloud, obviously, with Donald Cosman, who was the head of research, who created the Microsoft cl cloud, and which blockchain relies on in many transactions. So without the cloud, there is no blockchain. It's like without, and with the cloud, there is no Davos. Today, we have no cloud, and we have Davos. So, <laughs> <laughs> welcome, Yorki. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I would like to, First, open the first um, uh, round, as we uh, as usually do, is that everybody introduces briefly himself and what their focus is and how fine a fintech um, is, can challenge or can provide solutions to the current financial fabric. Alexander. Um, how many hours do I have for the <laughs> second question? <laughs> uh, it's the first one. So the first one is a couple of minutes, the second one is me look. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think you've introduced me, so I don't need to introduce myself, except to say that I've always had a, an interest in monetary economics and money and so on. And three years ago, my wife said, uh, there is this thing called Bitcoin. What is it? Uh, look at it. Can you tell me? And, and I looked at it and I couldn't understand it. And then I asked myself, is it money and so on? So I got interested in, that, in, that, uh, in, in, in those uh, types of uh, questions. Now, uh, where does it impact my work? Uh, it impacts it, or my, it impacts it in two dimensions. 
One is if you want to keep up with financial markets, understand what's happening and so on, uh, there's no way you can do that without trying to understand what is going on. And um, I think I was telling you there was a quote I had used in some presentations, if I can find it, which is a quote that uh, Wolfgang Munchau gave in the FT in 2014, uh, which whoop, will come. Uh, the degree to which economists have ignored Bitcoin is surpassed only by the extent to which Bitcoin enthusiasts have ignored economics. <laughs> so I've been trying to, to bridge that gap a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure I've really su succeeded. But anyway, uh, my other interest is in economic policy, central banking, financial stability, capital flows, and so on. And in that field also, fintech in general, uh, blockchains and so on in particular, but fintech in general, the combination of all the innovations is, um, is causing all sorts of challenges, uh, has new opportunities for regulators, central bankers and so on, but it has also challenges for them. Now, I would be talking a little bit about those challenges and opportunities, but I think, Caspar, uh, uh, that is for a second round. Yep. Thank you, Veronica. Yes, thank you. I'm um, certainly not, not just a representative of a bad bank here. I think banks are providing a lot of useful services, but, but clearly I think technology changes and also the, the changes in, in, um, in, in the consumer <coughs> behavior and expectations is, has really made a big difference over the past few years um, for, uh, for all banks. Um, so w when we look at the, 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 the wider topic of fintech, it's really impacting um, at three different levels. It's, exp it's impacting at the client experience level. We see this, this increased um, access um, uh, options for, for people to financial services. We see um, large platforms that have evolved the digital um, uh, tech companies that are increasingly moving into, into offering also payments and, and, and very simple um, uh, services that previously had only been owned by banks. And, um, and so there is uh, almost like a, 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 an increased access and democratization um, that, that is also including many more people to the financial system. I think um, um, if we look at China, there's over 700 million uh, users of, of, of we, uh, WeChat pay, uh, payment services, etc. So there's a whole lot of people that are now using electronic um, uh, changes. And that is a big change from an industry that previously had been predominantly using personal contact for engaging with their, um, with their clients. And the second angle is around um, um, the product innovation bit and, and how can we really use technology to, to get better at, at, at creating products and, and that starts with having, uh, having more data and more automated intelligent algorithms that we can use to produce <coughs> um, products but also um, in terms of um, exciting new uh, areas that we see with the tokenization, with the digitization of, of, of other assets and new assets coming up, which is an area that we are uh, heavily exploring at the moment. And then last but not least, it's, it's that, that collaboration also with other partners and, and with um, also regulators uh, on, uh, on building the new, the new rails and the new infrastructure so that we can gain more efficiencies. Um, that are so required in this industry that has built up over, over, over 10, 20 years with lots of complex processes, which clearly need some optimization. There's lots of room for improvement. And it's about bringing that together. So, so um, um, we have this one example where we've introduced um, video online onboarding for new clients in, in Switzerland. And, and, and effectively, because we worked very closely with the regulator, um, we could basically, by the, by the time we had it developed after a couple of months, we could go live with it immediately because the regulation also was there. And, 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 and that collaboration across all angles within the company, with our employees, and, and with the ecosystem, being that small companies and startups with good ideas or, or larger companies is very important. So we, as an innovation function in UBS, uh, we take care about a lot of that research and that collaboration enablement. So uh, the stress is on the collaboration with the different stakeholders and the proper regulation that you can actually deploy all these innovative um, steps that you undertake. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's great. Nuria, the consumer. 
Is he the good one or the bad one like me? Well, uh, well, first I'll introduce myself. Uh, so I'm director of research in data science at Vodafone globally. And I'm also chief data scientist in a nonprofit organization called uh, Data Pop Alliance, which is an alliance created by MIT, Harvard, the Overseas Development Institute, and Flowminder, who are four nonprofit organizations <laughs> themselves. And the goal of this nonprofit is to realize the vision of using big data for positive social impact. So my area of expertise is modeling and understanding and predicting human behavior from data using artificial intelligence techniques. I've been doing this since the mid 90s. I did my PhD at MIT. And what has changed over time is which behaviors and which data I have used to understand people. So the intersection between this session and my uh, expertise um, comes because my answer to the question, let's financially include 3 billion people, is uh, the best tool that I think that we have to do so is the mobile phone. So for the past 10 years, I have been working on understanding human behavior as seen through the mobile phone network or through the actual devices. Um, so I've done a lot of projects on understanding different aspects of both aggregate and individual human behavior, and some of them have an intersection with financial inclusion. The phone, as you know, there are more phones in the world than people. Uh, and the mobile phone is the most widely adopted piece of technology in human history. More people have access to the phone than access to drinking water or to proper sanitation. And what is interesting in the context of answering this question is that it's a global <laughs> phenomenon that is happening both in developing economies and in developed economies. So with that context, some of the projects that I've done and I'm working on are related to financial inclusion. Given the fact that everyone has a phone, <coughs> given the fact that there are 2 billion people in the world who are unbanked and who have no access to credit and who basically don't exist from the financial system perspective, but who need access to credit because, as Kaspar said, they won't be able to prosper. They won't be able to uh, uh, buy a cow or buy whatever or create a small business without access to credit. Uh, how can the phone help? And in that context, we showed that uh, <coughs> um, from the uh, analyzing the mobile behavior of people can actually be seen as a proxy for credit worthiness. And we can create an alternative credit scoring system that is based on your mobile phone behavior. So when an unbanked person needs credit, they don't have a bank account, but they do have a mobile phone. So they could say, well, I'm a trustworthy person. You know, my mobile phone behavior you know, demonstrates that. So you can actually give them credit and uh, are more advantages, you know, uh, conditions than, than if not. We've also found that we can infer socioeconomic status from aggregate mobile data. And this is very valuable because understanding the socioeconomic status of a region is a proxy to access to education, to healthcare, to, you know, to proper, you know, services. And as you know, right now, the, uh, the golden standard, the ground truth for socioeconomic status is usually census data, which is typically obsolete. Because in most developed countries, the census is elaborated every 10 to 12 years. But in many developing economies, it's, it's, it's elaborated maybe every 20 or 30 years. For example, the last census from DRC, I think, is from the 80s, which obviously is total, totally meaningless today. But again, people have phones. So can we infer socioeconomic status from you know, the patterns of behavior of the mobile phone? And finally, the last piece that I wanted to mention is uh, the revolution that is happening and has happened for the past years in the context of peer-to-peer -peer mobile uh, uh, money transfers, uh, transactions using the mobile phone, where I think the most emblematic company is M-Pesa, which is owned by Vodafone. So I'm also very interested in understanding from a research perspective what is the value that M-Pesa is bringing to the societies where it's being used. How can we actually make it more inclusive? How can we... Uh, uh, expand the impact that it has to uh, properly answer this question that you, that you were mentioning uh, in the panel. Thank you. Give everybody a mobile phone and the world will be better tomorrow. <laughs> that's, my, that's what I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, Yorki. Yes, uh, so my name is York Rhodes and uh, I'm one of a couple of people who uh, brought us down the blockchain journey. I actually started um, uh, teaching about Bitcoin in my e-commerce class um, quite a few years ago. 
Um, and I wasn't too excited about it from a technology perspective um, until in the summer of 2015 when people started talking about blockchain as a noun. And then as a technologist, it became interesting to me. So I started probably a few years too late in terms of investment. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, it's, been a, it's been an interesting journey. Um, blockchain, uh, you know, as, as we look at from a Microsoft perspective, it is a catalyst for digital transformation. Whether you wind up with a blockchain or not, that in and of itself is good, right? So um, in the context of financial inclusion, um, you know, I would ask the question, like, if, if everybody has a phone, and a lot of people have had phones since 2000, yeah. right? We haven't really solved the problem, right? But, and that's because technology doesn't solve these problems, right? There are so many more systemic things, right, that, that have to come into place to solve things like financial inclusion. Um, we actually um, uh, sort of believe that, um, and this sort of goes to your point about, uh, that you were making about what does the phone give you access to, is that uh, economic transactional history and identity actually solve for financial inclusion. Those are some of the foundational things that uh, help you solve for that. Um, just as an aside, I mean, our, our job as, a, as an organization is to help uh, enterprises like UBS and others cross the chasm um, to figure out how do I make use of new technologies in general. So blockchain is a, a, a similar vehicle as a technology where, where we do those types of things. So, uh, blockchain happens to have many other really interesting qualities besides, you know, being a tradable uh, commodity or currency, depending on how you look at it, or new asset class, potentially. Um, again, depending on how you look at it. Um, but it's a fascinating opportunity for transformation, and um, particularly, uh, you know, we think there's some aspects of financial inclusion that will help with. Perfect. Thank you so much for the first round. Uh, today we read a lot about financial technology, we read a lot about fintech, uh, there is a lot of buzzwords out there. And it's very difficult to make sense already from within the community, I think most people do not know what they're talking about. And it makes even no sense at all from people who have no clue at all about technology and don't understand finance as such in a way uh, uh, anti-importance to our daily lives and the growth the growth potential of the future. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask the panel, mm -hmm. what would you like to, What's what would you consider, sorry, the most important ingredient that is necessary in order to make all this new technology prosper in society and in economic, socioeconomic fabric, not only in our world, but also in the developing world. Because we have, let's say, the three worlds which I depicted in the program. It's on one hand, it's from the technology industry side, and then we have value chains, we have opt-out midstream, we have the sides from finance and markets, <coughs> and we have the sides of the policies and the laws, which current realities and possible future regulations. I would like to ask the panel, because we have here a diversity which is very unique, because we have so-called a representative, let's say, of the international, international fabric of regulations and policies with Alexander. <coughs> we have of a big bank uh, aspect from Veronica. We have from the mobility, which is absolutely key in the financial uh, technology world. Without the mobility, there will be no inclusions. And we have the aspect of the pure tech side from Microsoft, which is the other ingredient. So we have from the tech side, from the mobility, from accessibility, from the proper banking, providing the financial services, and then how to regulate and how to frame the rules and the laws to not obstruct the new innovation, but to accommodate and leverage the good sides across all societies and not to be abused by others or not to abuse others. Maybe um, I would like to start for that reason with, uh, with Veronica. What would you consider from your perspective the, the most important ingredient in all these three worlds? Well, um, I, I mean, we've also come our journey, especially on the blockchain uh, world, where we started uh, 2015 with our, our lab in London to explore this. And I, I, I think uh, when we looked at use cases in the beginning, everybody said, thought blockchain would solve everything. And, and, and that created a bit of a tech hype. But it's really about understanding what is the problem that, that you can solve and that you want to solve. And, um, and, and a lot of the fintech startups and the smaller companies have actually come with great ideas. But what we see is that often they fail to, to grow and scale internationally because of, of 
of the growth that it requires as a company, but also because of the diversity of, of regulation and different systems, both in terms of like payment rails, but then also from a compliance perspective, etc. So I, I think one of the benefits that that and that, that we can bring in and, and what we have experienced in working together with fintechs has been that, that we can actually combine this very well. So we uh, actually get a lot of um, um, new ideas and sometimes also new tech that we can understand how that helps to remove and resolve uh, pain points that clients have. Because as it was rightly said, I mean, why would it take five days to, to transfer money uh, internationally today where you can speak live with anyone um, over Skype today? Um, <coughs> And, uh, um, and, and then uh, secondly, what we can bring in is help to, to grow and roll out. So where initially all these startups, it was perceived as if they were true competition to what we were doing, you can see that the majority of the startups are actually um, looking for collaboration with larger institutions because large institutions can help them scale out. And what we can also do and what we are doing is, is bringing in and, and the regulators in our context and driving that discussion. So from the blockchain perspective, uh, whilst we used at, at, at while we looked at um, use cases for the banks specifically in the beginning, like uh, how can we create a smart bond product on blockchain or how can we uh, remove our loyalty points and make them uh, digital money or how can we uh, introduce a, a, a solid new tr a digitized trade finance solution, we kind of understood that digital cash and digital identity were key enablers. So now we're suddenly having a whole different type of conversations because we talk about how do we get to a secure system of digital identity in Switzerland and in other countries. And, and I think that's the dialogue and also where the larger corporations can really bring input because we now work together with tech providers, with regulators in the various areas. And once you have this a digital identity, for example, in place. It nurtures all kinds of use cases, um, health, um, food tracing, educational use cases, and a lot of really um, um, needed improvements that, that uh, can help inclusion, but also social services. You not only provide uh, basically the size for new technology, the access to the markets, but also the nexus to the regulations and the, the rules of the games. The dialogue as such, because it's very difficult for small companies to focus on raising the money and, and developing the technology. And you prob uh, probably also provide a platform for beta testing, for testing their new innovation, correct? In, in, in various forms, direct collaboration, indirect through incubators. Ex exactly, uh, we, we use the whole, the, the whole spectrum. We use the but whole area, internal well, developments, we work with um, accelerators, we work with academia institutions on certain research questions. Maybe quick, uh, a quick definition for, ac um, because I'm probably somewhat from different segments. What is an accelerator? I know it from the car, but I'm not so sure I know it from <laughs> finance. Well, the idea is the same. The idea is that you take a great business idea and you accelerate its development to market introduction um, by bringing in the right, um, the right fuel at the right time. And that means that there's now quite a few um, um, professional, but also um, um, public spaces where um, young companies or, or, uh, or startups can actually go in. They can come in with a with an early idea of a business proposition and then the accelerator provides them with, with mentoring, with teaching, with teaching with experts that coach and help, but also sometimes with us like a bank coming in and giving our perspective about what would it take for that product, for that solution to work. And then that helps them to really much faster have that dialogue with their future clients to develop. Oh, thank you very much. Now, Microsoft is very interesting. Microsoft has, I just read today in Washington, reached a new peak in market cap, correct? Mm -hmm. What, 700 billion we are now? Uh, or more? I don't even I know. <laughs> I just look at the chart and it, re it went above 2,000. Yeah. <laughs> so Bill Gates must be very happy and Paul Allen too. Now, in coming back to Microsoft, I mentioned this with a purpose because Microsoft was built basically on producing a product. Yes. Which is, uh, and you can buy or not buy it. You have the choice. Now, it's very interesting with my conversation with, with Donald from the research side when he, he developed the cloud and he reached out and we had uh, substantial discussions now to try to understand we can no longer just produce a product and sell it to the market. It is, uh, we need to open up in a different way and collaborate even with 
previous perceived competitors like oh, IBM or like Oracle or like uh, Vodafone, I guess, and so on. No longer can you impose, let's say, a product, say, eat or, or die. It is different. And it's amazing how the whole the, the industrial fabric opened up for collaboration. Yeah. And coming back to the question which I mentioned, which would you consider now the most important ingredient for Microsoft and for your department, particular blockchain applied in finance, to prosper? Well, I think, uh, it, based on where we are, and I agree what you said, Veronica, the, you have to sort of get down to the fundamental things. And I think blockchain has taught us something pretty dramatic. Um, you know, one, it's you know, taught us that there's this great open source community that's rapidly developing new concepts every week that's hard to keep up with, and this should be embraced. Um, but I think if you start to boil down, this is the, the key thing that I think blockchain taught a lot of us is that you can't participate in this interesting transformative technology unless you have an identity or a key. And then, therefore, how do we now manage those keys? How do we look at consumers holding those keys on their mobile phones? How do we secure that? How do we ensure that uh, consumers who today don't do a very good job with passwords now have a password that has money associated with it, right? So that's kind of a problem, right? There are a number of systemic things that we have to actually solve for to get beyond uh, where we are, but I think just uh, the, the basic uh, idea of identity, and you, even if you look at tokenizing commodities, that's effectively an identity, right? So identity has uh, really risen to the top in terms of a, a, a core new way to think about uh, tokenization and digitization. And you know, a company like Microsoft, we have uh, 400 engineers who work on identity products for the last 20 years, and we didn't discover this, right? Um, because we're not really necessarily been working on identity products. We've been working on authentication right, and, uh, and authorization products. Um, and so this is a big mind shift for us, but we have uh, a team sitting within that identity team who's focused very specifically on this idea that any consumer can hold a key, and that key is a way that that consumer can be identified and transact against. Um, and you know, how do you do all those things associated with that? And so we've also applied that in the humanitarian context where we say, well, that identity can actually represent a real person and you could tie transactional history to it and, and start to gain some value from that uh, in a financial sense for, for those consumers or constituents as well. Thank you so much. So you mentioned a very important word which is also coming up later on and which will be addressed by Idris who just got up right now. It's about identities, and identities without identity, we will not be able to include all the, sure. the billions of people, these big numbers, uh, to become an active participant in our, in our um, uh, global economic, socio-economic fabric. Um, Nuria, from the consumer side, uh, or from the mobility side, obviously you would stress that the mobile accessibility, reliable, trustworthy, and cheap, or for free almost, is absolutely essential for making fintech happen. Am I wrong? <coughs> I, think, I think you're right. Uh, but I think in the context of this area of fintech, um, I think, um, and, and I think Veronica was alluding to this, I like using the, con the, the concept of PPPP, which means public private people partnerships. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's, it's not going to be, po probably it's going to be very difficult for a single private or public entity to solve this problem. So the public private partnership, and you were talking a lot of different partnerships with the startups and we know, uh, in the context, for example, of a technology company or a telecommunications company like Vodafone, uh, there's obvious partnerships that need to happen with, you know, financial institutions, but also obviously with the government, you know, and regulators, because this is also a regulated, you know, industry. But I want to add the, the third P, which is the people. Mm -hmm. So I think whatever project we do that is going to be affecting hundreds of millions or billions of people has to have the people uh, in the project as well. So in that context, um, there are initiatives in terms of having living labs or you know, sandbox, sandbox environments where the people can actively participate, co-create, provide feedback, and be involved you know, in, in the solution, in the resolution you know, of this big problem. 
Another topic that hasn't really been mentioned very much, but that me uh, personally worries me a lot, and I am investing uh, a lot of uh, additional work you know, on this, is actually the education gap that we have right now. Uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to make informed decisions at any level in companies, in governments, and obviously individual citizens if they don't understand what are these decisions that they are making about. And uh, you mentioned it, Kaspar, that even in sort of like expert uh, circles, many people don't even understand what they're talking about. So imagine a government officials or people making decisions in companies or citizens, um, you know, and when uh, uh, the consequences of not understanding can have tremendous impact on you. You know, uh, I think we have a challenge there. So, so I think education is something that we cannot forget. Mm -hmm. uh, technology, technological progress is very fast, and societal <laughs> society is very slow. Political, you know, uh, legal, educational systems—they have kind of like this linear progress, and technology has this exponential progress. And you know, it's getting. Uh, the gap is getting bigger and bigger, and in the context of developing economies, you know, the gap is huge. Mm -hmm. So we need to invest in technology literacy, data literacy, you know, programs uh, at all levels. And I think we're not going to solve this problem if we don't accompany it with education, because uh, we are not going to be able to have a system that will be widely adopted, that will people understand, you know, if the governments of the countries where this is going to be implemented don't understand it, if the people don't understand it, you know. So I think the education for me is a key element as well. Education is key. Collaboration is key. We have giving people an identity to reach the mass is key. Now all that is embedded in providing better services in order to accommodate the three billion people. There is one thing that I didn't hear so much, but I think which is the absolute fundament, is you all of, be it from technology market or from the, from the policy side is, you have to create an environment or a product or a service which provides trust to the client. We will not, we will not buy a product or be serviced by somebody who we don't trust. At the end, finance, a medical doctor, law is about trust. It's a people business. At the end, there is the person and individual in the center and not the technology. Alexander, from your side, you have seen so many cycles, so many evolutions in technology, in finance. Companies go down and come back up again. Countries go down, come back up again. You trained all these soldiers who today try to make a sta more stable world in terms of economic fabric. I would like to ask you, what is the most important greeting to make all this beautiful tech bus really work and service us as citizens and accommodate the three billion people in the world? Uh, if I had the answer. <laughs> No, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I lost my voice and my mind uh, to uh, call. Um, yeah, I think from my perspective, in a, in, in a way, regulation has a role to play in giving trust. I mean, what you what 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 is important is that you have a record, as it is always said. You can, it takes a long time to build up your credit. It takes a second to lose it. So basically trust is something that is built over time. That responsibility within companies, uh, responsibility of people, responsibility of governments and so on, to, to do things in a consistent way and not defraud people. Now, that's easier said than done, obviously. And this is where the uh, regulation comes in as a sort of a garde-fou. Uh, and you will have regulation at all sorts of, of, of levels over fintech. Uh, on some of the things on protect the consume, consumer protection, on regulation of various products developments in finance. Uh, you would have uh, developments in taxation to make it relatively fair so that people don't have too much of an incentive to evade it. Uh, you have it in all sorts of ways. I think there are uh, uh, three 
challenges that I want to 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 to, to point out in the uh, fintech context. One is uh, we talked a lot about identity, but that, to my mind, also raises concerns about privacy mm -hmm. and what is the correct balance between anonymity and accountability. And that is an extraordinarily hard balance to find. And uh, we can give examples, but anyway, that's one thing. The, 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 the second one is that one of the things that happens in fintech and all the developments is that they rely quite a bit on network externalities. And that as something catches up, there are advantages to it growing further. And that raises all sorts of questions about competition, about size, about control, and so on. Uh, the discussions about should Amazon be, for instance, regulated in a particular way. And that applies also to, 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 to other fields in fintech. Uh, finally, I think, and, and, and this panel is a very good example of that, uh, we're not only talking about fintech and what regulators in every nation should be doing about it and so on. We, got, we are in an era where this technological development is combined with globalization. And in fact, these technological developments like the internet, the World Wide Web and so on, are factors of, are the agents of globalization in many ways. That also means that there is a, a, a worldwide uh, stake yes. in keeping that going, in keeping that open, and in building, to come back to your question, the trust mm -hmm. in the whole system. And it's a fragile system. We have to be worried about that and conscious about it. But I think this international dimension, for instance, regulation, is, is, is going to, to be there. Uh, it means that decisions or, or suggestions have to be discussed not only at the national level but at a wider level. And it requires, if it's going to, to work, some citizen participation and some sort of... I hesitate to, in, in, in the world of very different meanings of the world, of the word and very different degrees, some, some element of democ democracy and participation. Yeah, I think on the trust issue, I think it has a connection with education because we tend to mistrust what we don't understand or what we don't know. So I think if, the more you understand something, you know, the more you are able to trust it. And another point that I wanted to make is that so there are technologies like the distributed ledger technology that uh, is able to implement transactions between people that don't necessarily trust each other. I think that's one of the actual uh, use cases of using distributed ledger because uh, you know I, couldn't trust, I can transact with anonymous people that I don't trust, but because there is a record of all the different, you know, and it's all public, uh, it uh, it sort of like compensates for the lack of trust. You know, I can transact with a centralized authority that I trust, but if it's a decentralized system that has some warranties of uh, you know, being transparent and accountable, I can do transactions with people that do, I do not trust. Mm -hmm. So you like to be transparent through the distributed ledger technology. On the other hand, Alex, okay. and you stress there is a balance to strike between anonymity and transparency. Mm -hmm. How do you yes. square these two things? Uh, I, I, I think what Veronica is in mind, I think, is, 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 is absolutely correct. Uh, you have a, if you have a public blockchain which is not entirely private, that there are some controls, that in the inputs are some know your customer stuff and so on, then that will work. If it's purely anonymous, uh, it may work in certain fields, I don't think it works in the payment f and financial field that well. Yeah. I mean, in probably in health and so on, uh, uh, you know, the privacy of your identity is traditional and, 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 and the distributed ledger and combined with a good way of ensuring the identity of the patient is going to do the trick. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, the, the point that I wanted to make was the, the fact that, you know, 
that we are developing technology that is able to mitigate some of the requirements in terms of trust, you know, by using this technology, depending obviously on the use case and depending on, you know, on, on, on different scenarios, but it's something to take into account. And on the privacy issue, usually we talk about um, uh, having this kind of like utility function where, you know, you have privacy on the one hand and then you have the value that you get from giving up your privacy on the other hand. And I think it is a personal decision to say, well, I am willing to give up some of my privacy because the value that I get from you know, giving up some of my privacy is X. The key there is two pillars, transparency. I need to understand what privacy I'm giving up and what is the value that I'm getting from it. And control, I should be able to make that decision in a transparent way. And those pillars, transparency and control, I think um, in, in, the, in the early days of sort of like internet services, you know, and so forth, it's been a little bit the wild west where there was really no transparency and no control. I think now, you know, I don't know how many years later, precisely because of what I explained in terms of technology moving exponentially and society moving linearly, we're kind of catching up. And I think we are seeing increased understanding from people's sides and government sides and increased pressure to technology companies to actually execute on these two pillars. And I think GDPR is an example of, you know, um, a, clearly uh, stating you know, that people should have more control than they have right now and that there should be much more transparency than there is right now. That's interesting. Uh, uh, may, yeah, I, I, think, yeah. may I just say one thing <laughs> on, that, on the business of trust? Uh, I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. Right. But uh, the, I think w w what is crucial is to understand that you do need trust in people, you do need trust in institutions, you cannot just have a trust in a computer program. Mm -hmm. And this is the business about the, the Bitcoin ecosystem, that you can do away with any intermediary, with any trust in any individual, any anything, you're, you're just within the network. Yeah, but at I the think end the day, yeah, yeah, at the end, of, you have to go to the yeah. real world, you have to you go outside. And, authority, yeah. and even within the system, yeah. Uh, you, you need to know who can change the yeah. system, what yeah. happens. So in the end, there's no way to bypass, yeah. if you wish, political or governing or controlling yeah. institutions. Yeah. May I quick, Alexa, quickly come back to the three challenges you mentioned. It's the number one point was the balance, the balance point that you mentioned, the three points which you mentioned yeah. of challenges. The first one was identity, privacy, and anonymity, mm -hmm. accountability balance. The second was the network externalities, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And the second point is something I think we tend to forget. What is interesting, David Lipton from the IMF. Every si David Lipton is the deputy managing director from first the... Deputy. Oh, for, for, sorry. First, the first de deputy. He's number two, right? He's number two. Yeah, at the fund, but he's the first deputy. First deputy, sorry. De <laughs> deputy <laughs> managing oh, director, okay. and he's the first He's the first. Manager. So after Christine, he's, he's the guy. <laughs> after Christine Lagarde, he, he's, he's in charge. Yeah, it's always an American, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry for, for the, the titles, anyway. <laughs> so that, what, so what I'm impressed, is. though, what he stressed in every single panel that I attended, he closes the panel with, beware of the losing side. Mm. Or he mentioned like the externalities. Beware of the losing side. Because if you marginalize the ones who are less well off than before or are being pushed aside without contributing anything bad, things may come back at you and hunt you. Mm. I mean, that's why way. I said PPPP. That's why I include the right. people there. Right. Because I think it's critical. Exactly. And the third point was the globalization uh, point with the uh, internet as agents that could lead into uh, um, in, in a, f in a system fragility. Yeah. I mean, it's both part of it, both part of globalization and an agent of globalization. Right. Perfect. So now I make a statement. And I started with, it took me six months to open up a bank account in Switzerland as a Swiss. Not that I should be privileged, but six months is simply too long. Nobody can wait. Six months. It takes how much to be, become to make a child? It's nine months. It takes six months to open up a bank account. How That's long does it take to become a Swiss citizen? Yeah, how Oof. long? <laughs> that is, that is too long. <laughs> too long. <laughs> so, okay. That's not my problem. It's right? not my problem. <laughs> okay. I say banks are bad. <laughs> banks are bad. They don't service us properly, and they always go bankrupt. And then we have to pay their bailout. So banks are bad. 
Um, let's scrap them all. We don't need them anymore. And put all the banking on the cloud and the trust into blockchain. Now, that would be heaven, I guess. Um, York, you are the <laughs> proponent of the new world. We don't need the UBS any more than the Credit Suisse. Microsoft will be the leader, the bank of the future. <laughs> Not at all. No. I, I, I mean, banks perform many more functions than retail banking, clearly. So I think there's, you know, tr tr banks will be around for a long time. Will a retail bank branch be around for a long time? Probably not. But, um, and that's just digitization, right? I mean, so, um, uh, and by the way, Microsoft does not have any aspirations to be, to be a bank. <laughs> um, the, but I think the phenomenon of globalization uh, that we see in whether it's social media or blockchain or, or you know, other technologies is, is this border transcending uh, problem yeah. that forces, you know, I, I, when I have these conversations, I almost want to say, we really need a world government, a world governing organization to deal with some of these issues uh, because they, you know, they don't exist. And, you know, governance, I think, in tokenization and digitization is a re very important, um, and not governance by governments necessarily, but governance in general, whenever we have multiple parties performing transactions together on the same network of any type, whether it's supply chain or anything else. Um, and governance essentially is just an agreement by the parties about what are the rules, right? Actually, last night, Satya was uh, bringing up this concept Who is Satya? that I... Satya Nadella, the, the CEO of, of Microsoft, of Microsoft. he was mentioning that Brad, the, the legal counsel uh, to Microsoft, has brought this concept of a digital Geneva convention. Mm precisely to address this challenge of the fact that there is no borders in the digital world. Yep. And that, you know, how do you ensure something like the Geneva Convention, but in the digital world? So mm. uh, their uh, proposal was to have this digital Geneva Convention that will address all these governance challenges uh, trans-border. Yeah. Because... And I, yeah, and, and I think we know from the internet times that it was very important that we got to some protocol standards like mm -hmm. HTTP, et cetera, yeah. because that actually helped to connect everyone. And we see the same uh, situation happening in the IoT world with the machine um, uh, connectivity. And, and that's really key. And then you don't have to necessarily regulate and standardize the different business models or the different applications and processes that run on top of that. But you have that, that, that interoperability, and that's really important. Because at the end of the day, that, that what will help us give scale. Yep. And, and I fully agree with your, your comments on, on, on trust and literacy. Um, I, I guess many consumers still trust banks quite a bit, especially when, yeah. it's, when, it's, when it's larger money amounts, when it's more complex things mm -hmm. like financing your house with yeah. a mortgage. Um, um, although we see in the millennial and, and in the younger generation more trust also with digital platforms coming up, but <coughs> even when I speak to 18-year-olds to, to and I ask them where would you go if you had, uh, had $10,000 to invest, they say, I'll go to a bank, right? So there's still this level of trust, and that comes because we are so highly regulated. Now, yeah. because, because there are so many checks and balances which are making it also a bit of costly and often cumbersome. And, and it shouldn't be six months. I just opened a, a, a business, created a business, and opened a bank account in Portugal in two days. So things can actually wow. work uh, quickly. In Portugal? Yes. Was it you based Swiss in Portugal, in Portugal. or somebody else? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, um, uh, uh, SME business uh, or, uh, or so in, in Portugal. By the way. Uh, but but I, I mean, the, the point I want to make there is that there's lots of acceleration improvements happening happening in that space. But also, if, if like digital companies are, are, are are very carefully looking also if they really want to come into banking services because that's yeah. when the regulation kicks in and we yeah. want that we need that level playing field and that's all also the discussion we see with ICOs and cryptocurrency investments because many people didn't Please. know what they were investing yeah. in right. yeah. they didn't get it and there is there's a lot of conversations at the regulatory front now to see um, uh, can we please um, co protect consumers in putting all their yeah. money into coins if there's no, no promise guarantee about what, they, what they're actually investing into? And there's so, no promise. It's and, like and, a donation. Oh, no. and, 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 those, and, those, and those are safe things. There's no uh, promise at all. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's like it's a donation. It's like a free so, donation. So, so we're pushing the boundaries with these new systems and technologies, and, and then we're, we're bringing it back in. And I think that's, that's a very exciting I see promise. emotions coming up from the banking side and now and that I declare banks are bad. <laughs> 
Alexander. May I, may, 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 may I uh, oh, a side comment, Brad Smith, by the way, was oh, a yeah, student at our institute, and he gave his talk, in fact, uh, partly at our institute at the UN. Nice. Uh, yeah. So he was, he was indoctrinated by you to go yeah. back no, to no, Geneva? No, not by me. Oh, not by you. Okay. He, was was he, he, was on, he was on the legal side. He was on the legal uh, side. You know, we don't know anything. <laughs> but, but to come back to the legal side on that, uh, what, what we have to, to, to remember, when, once we have transactions and so on among people, we have a legal system. The legal systems differ from country to country, but mm -hmm. there are usually some common principles. And where, where things like initial coin offerings uh, uh, stretch the limits is that they are sort of in between. The regulators are always slower than the new developments. That's quite normal. Mm -hmm. yes. But uh, at some point, for instance, with initial coin offerings, uh, they have to come in. And I think the Chinese, I was talking to the Chinese regulators uh, uh, in September last year, uh, uh, just when they were uh, banning uh, initial coin offerings. And their record showed that at least 30% of the initial coin offerings were pure fraud. 30%? Yeah, yeah. uh, yeah. at, least, at least. At least. At least. And, uh. and, and if, you, if, you, if you look at the coin offerings in the United States and so on, it's in, I mean, th many of those things have absolutely no legal guarantee. They don't promise anything. Uh, they, you can go and buy a white paper uh, on the internet for the cheapest ones are about $300. The more reputable ones or useful ones are about $1,500. And what you do, you say, I want to create a, fund, uh, a, a, a company with that name. Uh, it's going to uh, apply blockchain to make it a better world, especially in health, for instance. Please make me a white paper. And they'll make you a whole thing, including a board, uh, maybe in some cases with fictitious names, but in some cases they ask you to fill it in, okay? And then and, and tell you how to, to what portion of the coins should be offered and what and so on. And then you go out and you offer your coins. But what the guy who gets the coin in exchange some of them, they get members in some sort of association to be created among all the holders who will have some unknown advantages. And this is something that is very worrisome. And it's very worrisome because when that collapses, it's going to give a bad name to all sorts of good things. And that's why you see, to build the right policies, to build the trust in the system in order to make the coins a good, a good part of the good finance to reach the marginal citizens. I would like to open up the floor to some questions. <coughs> yes, please. Maybe the name and uh, the question ends with a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Not with an exclamation mark. Whoa! Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, uh, my, my name is Raju Chidambaram. Uh, One second. I think I can But that's fine. Uh, my name is Raju Chidambaram. My question is for uh, Veronica. Uh, I'm a fellow and part of the MIT consortium that, that you're a sponsor. Right, and the problem we're trying to solve is everybody wants to enjoy the innovation from shared data. Nobody wants to release their data because of privacy, GDPR, all, ki all kinds of concerns, right? And that is the problem we are trying to solve, mm -hmm. uh, privacy-preserving transactions. Mm. Uh, how do we get something like that out of the academia, what is a use case where you would be willing to actually write a check for? <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think the fact that we're collaborating on this is, is extremely important, and not just with, with MIT, but also other institutions, because um, as, as, we, as we have a public change or, or even private change, we need, to, we need to fix that issue. I think one, one good example is probably a, a very recent project that we also published um, uh, about, uh, we call it Matrec, um, it's with some other banking partners, it's, it's a, a, an abbreviation for Massive Anonymous Data Reconciliation. And what we did there is <coughs> all the companies have like standard data um, that you need to know and check for, for, the, for the banking um, transaction to be, to be compliant. Now, um, 
if you look at the industry, a lot of banks have different data, right? The data quality is not consistent and it's not the right thing. So we implemented a blockchain, and effectively what now everybody, every bank that participates in that network can do is it can check their data consistency against <coughs> the other participants' data, but without revealing the data. Mm -hmm. So what you get back is a, an, an information about anomaly. Mm -hmm. Where is your data different from mm -hmm. the other? How big is the gap? And then you can go and solve it, and that's a different process. <coughs> and I think that's a very good example where basically you, you use that, that network, but you're not exposing anything. Yeah. And, and that's a trend, I think, where we're getting towards safe attestations from accredited um, um, uh, data um, providers um, that um, then can be combined and released as per an individual's or a company's need. Yeah, I mean, just from a, a technology perspective, um, this is something that we've enabled in our cloud, which is essentially trusted computing frameworks such that you can share data with other parties in a agreed secure format and allow querying ability against that data without the other party actually mm -hmm. seeing what the data is. Um, and this is quite a powerful construct yeah. that uh, because of this this idea that you need to compare things But not necessarily you're allowed to see it. So Thank you another question, please. Yes. Yes uh, Joe Riedweg, I'm an accountant tax advisor and administrator I've heard a lot of the word of trust uh, this morning from uh, Professor Swoboda. I fully agree. I think it should go even further the banks, their first innovation should be that they put the client into the center again. The client is just this frustrated individual uh, sitting somewhere, not getting any attention, not getting any response. And I think the banks really, rather than thinking about fintech, they should spend millions on getting the client in the middle again. That is first and central, in my opinion. Was that a question or a statement? Statement. No? It is. Uh, but uh, but I uh, but I but it I, is it, if it's it is, directed to me, it I, is whatever <laughs> it is taken for. Yeah. Uh, I so put the yeah, no, I, 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 I take this as a question, um, and and I and I fully agree. I'm also a, I'm also a bank inclined. I right? can I I have have had uh, ex uh, frustrating experiences myself. Um, we're investing heavily in what we call the whole client experience program. That's one of the biggest investment parts. And the good thing is that fintech or fintech um, um, services can help us with it. The difficulty is where previously people had their advisor and the advisor knew everything about you and he could very easily advise you. Now a lot of the interaction happens on the, on the, on the mobile phone or on the on online banking. So we need to rebuild all that knowledge in basically into the system of the bank so that the, that, that the digital channels can respond in a very personal and very knowledgeable way. And that's actually difficult to do. So I think um, we, we simply have a lot of legacy um, and, and a long way to, to, to mirror that. And, and that there's great progress and Nuria is probably a better place to talk about how machine learning and, and, and new sensing technology helps basically to, to augment our systems to, to, to do and deliver a better experience. But it's this end-to-end -end automation, um, and that is in the investment bank, it's in the retail bank, it's in wealth management, it really is everywhere. We simply have these processes built up for a long time, but now we can start reducing them significantly. And, 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 and that's happening with like online onboarding, with getting data together, with automating. We're fighting hard here um, together with other market participants to get digital signatures established. And when you then can click and sign things, you don't have to um, have a paper process accompanying things. I mean, so all of this is, is, is going on. So I think it, it is a big focus for banks. Yeah, and it's an issue that transcends banks, right? The yes. same thing that you're doing, putting a uh, consumer in control of their own data at the center of all their transactions, applies to healthcare, government services, yeah. identity. Uh, right? no, no, now, if I may on that one, uh, putting the consumer in control of his own data is a very polite way of saying, let the consumer do the work because that's exactly what's happening in, in banks and in other places, uh, or, or in the grocery shop. Now you don't have checkout people. You've got to check it out yourself and then pay the thing and so on. It's a, and, and unfortunately, from my perspective, this is a, a, a way which depersonalizes relationships, any professional relationships, because everything has to be done through artificial intelligence and so on, including driving cars. Now, uh, 
that's fine to some extent, but it does raise questions. And sometimes you, the, the, the consumer asks, well, what do I get in exchange? And I'm not sure mm. the consumer always gets that much in exchange, sure. except a bit more work. I mean, related to that, actually, I wanted to mention some research which might um, anticipate what could happen in this sort of like um, a dehumanized world, a world where there's a lack of human interactions, which is there was some recent research where they um, asked people what was the, me the main way that they uh, uh, obtained information, if it was using digital means and online, or if it was using reading the newspaper or asking people. And what they found was that there was a very significant difference in how much people trusted other people and, and then they ask them different kinds of other people, your neighbors, people you run into the street, people of a different nationality, people of a different religion. Mm -hmm. There was a very significant difference between the people who preferred to obtain their information through physical means, who tended to be much more trusting of other people than people who access uh, all their information using digital means. And my hypothesis is that when you do everything digitally, um, you don't exercise human interactions. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, if I'm here in Davos and I need to go from promenade X to promenade Y and I'm using Google Maps, I'm not talking to anyone, right? If I didn't have Google Maps, I would ask people on the street. So the fact that we don't exercise interacting with other people, it is making us trust other people less because, yeah. you know, we, we don't use yeah. it, right? And it's we sort a chicken of lose and egg it, right? Problem, yeah. so, so something interesting that could happen, <laughs> which is related to this concept of trust, is what will happen when your entire life you actually don't interact with other physical humans. Could there be an impact on how much we trust each other? And I think we are seeing some of this with all the uh, xenophobic movements that are happening right now and with uh, the lack of trust that there is uh, increasing, actually, uh, towards people that are sort of like different to you, right? And perhaps, and this is just a hypothesis that I'm launching here, no? perhaps if we interacted more, face to face with people who are different to us, you know, that will help us build this trust that it seems we might be losing because of, uh, of, uh, of not interacting, you know, with human beings. Yeah, and, 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 and on that last point, it's typical that if you analyze voting, the people, for instance, who are strongest voters against immigration are from regions where there is no immigration. Yeah, they haven't had the... Yeah, they haven't had and, the and I think it goes back to education, because yeah. you don't trust what you right. don't know, exactly. right? So they have these stereotypical, I guess, images of where immigrants are, which have nothing or, to do with reality. Or, right? or specifically yeah. and very deliberately skewed images. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much. I would like to conclude... I would like to conclude and try to summarize what we have learned today. What do we need to do to reach the 3 billion people to financially include him into our socioeconomic fabric. From Alexander's side, include the citizen to build right regulations which provide a system of trust. While from Veronica, the key is in collaboration between all stakeholders to have a successful outcome. From Nuria, education is essential for financial literacy to properly apply the new technologies. And from York, Banks will be here for a long time. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone to come here this morning. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.